All right. Today is Sunday, the 23rd of April. This is a recap of the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's begin with this since um, this is the first public video in about three weeks. Although I did release a 420 special on Thursday. And by 420 special, I mean that I was too high and I released the video accidentally to the public. But in any case, it counts. But since this is the official comeback video, I'd like to say thank you to all of the viewers who sent warm messages and well wishes in the last few weeks. And for those who decided to bail out on us and leave nasty messages instead, well, thanks for being there when I needed you the most. Thanks for the loyalty. Although it's not as bad as this fiance who left her uh, significant other the moment he got diagnosed with brain cancer. Ooh. Hey, honey, I'm about to die. Okay, goodbye. And I bet the guy's now wishing that he was dating Chad GPT instead. But maybe he can offer some advice to this gentleman right here from China who spent 21 hours begging on his knees for ex-lover to take him back. And rumor has it, his ex-lover said, okay, I'll take you back, but you gotta do another 21 hours this time around standing on your head. And of course, it was a trap. The guy did it and died anyways. So there you go. But the good news is for the viewers, in the last three weeks, the stock market did absolutely nothing at all out of respect to me the market said okay i'll stop i'll just stay here until you come back that's the good news the bad news is we're gonna have a new programming schedule we're gonna split the videos into the in focus segment and the market analysis the in focus segment will be mostly for public viewership the market analysis slash market recap which includes the macro data that we get throughout the day and the discussions and the Fed talk, yada, yada. Most of that would be preserved for the private channel. And then we'll do on Friday's highlights on the public channel. We'll do some Q&A videos. We'll do some bonus videos, specific analysis on utility stocks, for example, on fast food stocks, on earnings for the private channel. And then on Sunday, we'll do a big market analysis, comprehensive recap for the action we got throughout the week and an outlook for the week to come on the public channel. Now, when you have thousands of viewers, ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to please everybody. But I believe that this is going to work for most of us. It fits my schedule a lot better. And I believe most of you will be happy with the final product. Now, why am I keeping market analysis, all the market information for the most part in the private channel? Look, I've been doing so far two years plus worth of YouTube videos, 500 hours plus. Most of those who find value in my analysis already in the membership program in the channel and i believe that it's better fit to preserve this part of the show for them with that being said the public will not be cut off on sunday every sunday will be a comprehensive market analysis video but the reason why i'm doing this is i'm done bargaining with the trolls you know i spent four or five hours producing videos lots of work goes in and all you get is oh maverick you're a perma bear you doomer gloomer I'm done talking to these people. They come and go. They get excited in every single ratty, and then they get flushed down. There is no value to provide anything for them at all. It's a waste of time. And I've been there back in 21 when we warned people about what's going to happen. But we got called the same thing. Hey, you perma bear, you doomer gloomer. Which is, by the way, what T-Rex told the alligators when they warned him about the asteroid. And we know who won that one. But all joking aside, the same thing happened last summer. We got a massive bear market rally. I've been warning and saying, hey, this is not going to last. It's based on false premises. It's a bear market rally. We're going to go down. Oh, we got the same thing. You're a doomer maverick. You're missing out. The gains, bruh, yada, yada, yada. You can go back to these videos and look at the comments for yourself. They're exactly the same comments we're getting right now. And we know who won that one. And we know who's going to win this one too. And at the end of the day, folks, there is no winner. There's no missing out. The stupidity of FOMO, it's a zero-sum game. In any fake rally, in any permit scheme rally that requires more and more buying because it's not based on fundamentals, it is based on a stampede. These kind of rallies, there is a lot of money to be made in the upside, sure. But there is also money to be made in the downside when they frizzle out. Money exchanges hands. There is no such thing as missing out on the gains or FOMO. But again, I'm done bargaining and explaining things. I'm going to preserve that for the people who appreciate it the most. And by the way, when they talk about, oh, this is the bull market, Maverick, you missed it out. Uh, look at the SPX, the S&P 500 monthly chart. What bull market? What are you talking about? We did not even take the August highs from last year. 
and you're calling this a bull market. But again, folks, you know the story. Since the uh, thing, a lot of newcomers came to the market. They've never seen a bear market before. All of what they experienced is, oh, the Fed is going to fix it all. The Fed's pumps money, stocks go higher. QE kind of mentality. But again, this is how people learn. Sometimes we need to learn the hard way. And yours truly did learn the hard way back in a previous bubble years and years ago. And by the way, for the regular viewers of this channel, if you see these trolls in the comments, either ignore them or you might want to tell them. Get a job, punk. Yeah, get a job, punk. What are you doing all day stalking my channel? I know why, because you're insecure of your own analysis. You want somebody to check you out. Well, now, as the great Ray Liotta says, you pay me. And again, I'm very optimistic about the new programming. I think it's going to work out, at least according to my fortune cookie. Today told me a refreshing change is in your future, which was a lot better than last week's fortune cookie when it said, yes, asshole, your zero date till expiration options will expire worthless again. At least this week's fortune cookie was polite. Maybe it's bullshitting, but at least being polite. Now let's talk about this, folks, because you might have heard that the biggest debate right now is, is it a bull market? Or is it still a bear market? And it has been frustrating for both. Waiting and waiting and waiting. What's going to happen next? Those who grew bullish based on the promising momentum signals of the October low and in January have had their conviction sapped by the S&P 500 halting at exactly the spot the chart suggested it would. 4200. And with the market breadth flattering along the way. Horrible market breadth. Yet bearish investors are stumped by the tape's resilience. In the face of persistent signs of a slowing economy, ongoing earnings declines, the Federal Reserve's still unfinished tightening push, a feared credit contraction after the regional bank mini panic, and a potential U.S. ceiling breach popping over the horizon. Lack of conviction is both pervasive and understandable, as uh, bespoke investment groups summed it up. After Friday's close, for all of the talk about whether we're in a new bull market or still stuck in a bear, at this point it seems like neither. I guess it's the donkey market now. Anyhow, at this point it seems like neither. If you want to call it a bear market, it looks about as savage as a koala. And if you are going to go the bull route, it is raging more like a cow than a bull. So folks, maybe it is worth it to revisit the argument by both the bears and the bulls. Now, the bear argument is simple, and it has been consistent all along. We have record high inflation, the Fed was too late to the game, and they're not going to be able to take inflation down to the 2% target unless they induce a recession in the economy. Boom. It has been this way since the get-go. The bullish argument has uh, different layers, so it is worth looking into. Why don't we do that? And here it is. And by the way, this might be redundant to some of you, but it, it is worth going back and looking into it in details because from this point on, we're about to get really important earnings and the VIX is at lows we have not seen since the beginning of the year. In other words, this is the calm before the storm. Things are about to heat up now. And when they do, and they resolve one way or the other, you can look back at this video and understand why. The bullish argument, in a nutshell, is the Fed pivot. Now, what does a pivot mean at this point? Does it mean just to pause? Not according to the market. The market is pricing in a lot of rate cuts. So what the market is looking for is rate cuts, not a pause. This is what the pivot means. Now, there are two kind of pivots. There is the soft pivot and there is the hard pivot. The soft pivot says the Fed cut rates because inflation is heading down to 2%, which is the target, while the economy remains intact. In other words, the soft landing. The hard pivot says the Fed cuts rates because of a financial accident, a stock market crash, or unemployment spiking higher. Now, for now, for now, the market looks at both as good, good things. Soft pivot, good. Hard pivot, even better. And the stock market has been rallying since the SVB collapse for this particular reason. But I'm going to show you using historical data that the hard pivot is not the route the bulls or the market want to place their bets on. It's either the soft pivot or nothing. So what does that mean, soft landing? What does that mean? It means, number one, clear evidence that inflation is heading to 2% with no possibility of inflation rebounding significantly. We can see a little ticks higher once in a while. As inflation goes down to 3.5%, it might tick back to 37 but then it goes down again. That's no biggie. But major tick ups, that's a problem. Number two in the soft landing theory, the economy maintains healthy consumer purchasing power. Number three, the economy maintains low unemployment as inflation heads to 2%. Number four, and the final stage is the Fed cuts interest rates. Now, let's look at number one. 
Do we have clear evidence that inflation is heading down to 2% with no possibility of rebounding? When we look at the latest data, sure, the headline CPI is now down at almost 5%, down from almost 9% last year. This is a significant progress, but it is short of the 2% target. If the Fed is not going to wait for inflation to go down to 2% before cutting rates, it will be good enough for them to see a clear trajectory that by a specific timeline, inflation will be down at 2% with no rebounds, no major rebounds at least. The problem is, when you look at core CPI, which is the most important, core CPI is ticking. It remains highly elevated. It actually moved higher in the last reading because headline inflation only went down because of energy prices went down in that particular month. And since then, energy prices rebounded. So I'm not seeing a lot of um, assurances here that inflation will go down to 2%. And if I was the Fed chairman, I would look at this and say, yeah, I can't cut rates right now. You guys out of your minds? Look at the chart. And then we look at core services inflation. That's actually going higher at 7.3%. And Jerome Powell's uh, favorite indicator, core services, X housing, that is still above 6% and sticking, not going down like the headline. So all in all, do we have clear evidence that inflation is heading down to 2% with no possibility of it rebounding significantly? The answer is absolutely not. It will keep an open mind for now. Let's look at number two. The economy maintains healthy consumer purchasing power. What are we seeing right now? Savings rate among U.S. consumers? is actually at record lows right now. We haven't seen these kind of readings since uh, 05 and back in the 80s. All of that pandemic savings, that's poof, gone, and then some. But that's just one indicator. What about uh, debt usage, specifically uh, credit card debt? That is surging significantly higher. We closed at almost a trillion dollars in consumer debt. Now, if the consumer is really strong and healthy as, uh, you know, BOFA CEO keeps saying, the consumer balance sheet is really good. Yeah, what do you know about it? How about we talk to the consumers? Because if that's true, then why is the consumer continuing to use credit card? Why is the consumer continues to use and utilize debt? Well, the answer is their savings are now gone. Not all of them, but when folks run out of savings and they have inflation to deal with, they have to use debt. And the problem is rates are moving higher. Credit card debt is now at 19%, and that's the average. And the result of all of that is more U.S. consumers are falling behind on payments. Okay, so you got a consumer who already exhausted their savings. Now they have to use the credit card, but rates are going higher, so they're falling behind. What is the cumulative result of all of that? Retail sales are crashing. The consumer no longer has the disposable income to stimulate the economy. And soon enough, retail sales, according to the Johnson Red Book Index, for same store sales year on year, about to go negative. And we only see it negative during recessions. So again, we go back to the board. Is the economy maintaining healthy consumer purchasing power? Maybe for now, but these leading indicators that I showed you, they don't spell a lot of good things. But we'll keep an open mind. How about number three? The economy maintains low unemployment as inflation heads to 2%. For now, we got a check mark on this one. We don't know if Inflation is heading to 2%. It is sticky for now, but we have a record low unemployment rate in the economy. Here's the problem. I've been saying in this channel, as we head into recessions, usually the last block to fall is employment. We don't see the unemployment rate surging higher until we're already in the recession. Case in point, we go back uh, since the 1970s. The SPX, the S&P 500 in blue, the Fed funds rate in orange, and the unemployment rate in white. 1973 to 75, you can see the Fed funds rate peaks, meaning the Fed starts cutting rates before unemployment peaks. And we saw the same case back in 1980 with Paul Volcker. The Fed funds rate peaked first and then came the unemployment rate peaking later. And then what about the early 90s, the tequila crisis, which a lot of bulls, by the way, based their case on this example. That back then we also saw a little bit of inflation problem, a little bit of a recession scare, and then the market rallied either way. There was no crash. There was no recession. But even in that case, we see the Fed funds rate peaking first and then comes unemployment peaking later. In other words, the Fed responds to rising unemployment. The Fed starts cutting rates when they see unemployment rising. But there is always a lag. Always a lag when it comes to unemployment. What about the dot-com bubble? Once again, the Fed funds rate peaks first and then comes the peak in unemployment. Years later, it's a lag. How about we go to the GFC, 07 all the way to 2010. Fed funds rate peaks first, 
And then years later, the unemployment rate peaks. And again, why was the Fed cutting rates aggressively at that point? The answer is because they started to see unemployment rising in the economy. And we saw Bear Stearns blowing up. We saw Lehman blowing up. We saw Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Washington Mutual Bank blowing up. AIG was about to blow up. So the Fed was cutting rates aggressively. But it was a hard pivot. Then, of course, we go to a bullish case. This is the 2018 case um, when Jerome panicked, you know, because Trump was barking at him and he got too scared and he said, OK, I'm not going to raise rates anymore, which, again, in my opinion, is the biggest mistake in the Federal Reserve's history. In that case, we see the Fed pausing and starting to cut rates. The pause was good enough for the market to rally. But even when they started cutting rates, we did not see the unemployment rates spiking higher until later on during the pandemic crash. And now comes the great debate. Here we are. We're not seeing a peak in Fed funds rate, and we're not seeing the unemployment rate moving higher at all. And the bulls, the market looks at this and says, OK, look, we made progress on inflation. It went down from 9% to 5%, and not even the slightest move up in the unemployment rate. The bears will counter and say, yeah, you wait. Those cuts that you've been uh, jerking off to, the moment they happen, they will happen because the unemployment rate is moving higher. So there goes the debate. The bulls have a case right now. The chart is favorable to them. Fed funds rate moving higher, CPI going down, but the unemployment rate not even budging. So when it comes to number three, back to the board, the economy maintains low unemployment as inflation heads to 2%. I would say this is the strongest argument right now in the soft landing camp. What about number four? When all of these conditions happen, the Fed will cut rates and this will be good for the economy and good specifically for the stock market. Maybe we're rallying based on these expectations that the Fed will cut rates. Now, here's the chronology since this whole thing began. In 22, we see the Fed announcing rate hikes. They're going to come this March 22. What does the market do? It was in a bullish slash positive trend of higher highs, but then it broke that trend. It started to make lower highs and then it made lower lows and some would argue that that was the moment when we got into a bear market and then we got a bear market rally in march 22 because lots of talk about peak inflation okay inflation is going down now the fed will not have to do anymore 25 that's it then we realize that that's not going to happen inflation is moving higher the market goes down and of course last summer we got a reading in july with inflation month over month going down to zero because of energy prices going down. But we got again another fake rally based on peak inflation. Then came Jackson Hole Pound saying, what are you guys out of your mind? Inflation went down month, one month, one rating, month over month for a specific reason. And that's good enough for a cut and that's it? No, inflation is still at 9% in the headline reading. And the bear market goes sour and we go down again. Then comes yet another reading in October, another CPI reading, another inflation reading, suggesting that maybe we have peak inflation. And we got yet another rally, the Santa rally. But of course, the Santa rally did not happen. We actually got a sell-off in December. And the reason behind that was tax selling. Lots of people had losing positions and they needed to get rid of them for taxation reasons. Then comes a new year. No more tax selling. And we're still riding the peak inflation story. The stock market rallies. And then we get more inflation data suggesting that inflation is actually rebounding higher again. The stock market does a 180. And the assumption was we're going to go back to the October bottom because these readings of inflation take out all of this assumption about peak inflation. So we're going to be at the October lows. But then came the SVB collapse and it was a rescue for the stock market because now the conversation is no longer about inflation. The conversation is about pivot and rate cuts. Sure, it's a hard pivot, but the market loves it for now, so long as the end result is rate cuts. But when will the market realize that rate cuts at this stage is actually not a good indicator. If you're bullish, you don't want rate cuts. You don't want to even be near them. You, you tell Jerome Powell, keep rising, baby. Because when we look back at the chart, we go back to the 80s, again, Volcker, 1980. You got the SPX, and then you got in orange the Fed funds rate. Every time we saw a peak in the funds rate, meaning the Fed was cutting, the market actually went down. When the Fed was adding rate hikes, the market recovered. And when rates peaked once and for all in 81, that was the beginning of the crash. Initially, the market did rally based on that, assuming that, hey, peak rate hikes, they're cutting rates. That's beautiful. Only to realize that it was a trap and recession is not actually good. Higher unemployment is not good. The Fed is cutting rates for the wrong reasons. What about the dot-com? 
in blue SPX, in orange Fed funds rate, as you can see 2000, peak funds rate, they start cutting rates, the market crashes. The GFC 0709, Fed funds rate peaks, they start cutting rates, that was the moment the stock market started crashing. And now here we are, 2023. The Fed funds rate did not peak yet, but we have talks about it peaking really soon. The May meeting will be 25 and then pause. That's it. That's the peak. Well, if that's the case, maybe pausing is not that bad. But if the Fed started cutting rates as the market wants them to do, you better start stocking up on diapers because history suggests that if we have any rate cuts right now, the market will crash. Could this be the exception? There is a first time for everything. But again, as an analyst, as an observer, as an investor, I'm not going to bet on the first time to happen. History says if the Fed cut rates, we go down. And here it is. After the Fed starts cutting rates, in most cases, the market goes down. That very moment, the exceptions be it the 1995 example and the 2018. Absent of that, all of them went down the moment the Fed started cutting rates because they usually cut rates for the bad reasons, not because the market is bitching and whining and rallying on expectations that the Fed will cut rates. Never happened before. And I know what you're going to say. Hey, Maverick, uh, when crash, right? When crash? I want to know the exact date when the crash is going to happen so I can short and I become a billionaire. Okay, I got you. On average, from the last hike to the first cut, there's a six months gap. So if it is true that uh, May will be the, the last hike, you add six months from that point on, the crash happens at around October. Boom. Because based on history, if this holds that May is the last one, I, I disagree with that, by the way, but let's just assume that it is the case. Then it means in October, we're going to get the first cut on average, and then the market crashes from that point on. So again, we go back to the soft landing theory. Do we have clear evidence that inflation is heading down to 2% with no possibility of it rebounding significantly? Absolutely not. What about number two? The economy maintains healthy consumer purchasing power. That's not happening. Number three, the economy maintains low unemployment as inflation heads to 2%. That's check mark, at least for now. The bears are going to counter and say, oh, but unemployment is lagging. In the meantime, it holds. Number four, the Fed cuts rates. If you trust history and the data, that's not a good reason. It's not going to happen for a good reason. So the market shouldn't even consider Fed rate cuts in any soft landing uh, hypothesis. You see how shaky the bullish case is? They have to nail it. Exactly. Inflation goes down to 2%, no unemployment, the consumer is still flush with cash, and the Fed thinks that the economy is so good and beautiful. No need for rate cuts at all. Just keep it as it is. Normalizing interest rates once and for all, baby. It's kind of a stretch. But for now, maybe the bullish argument has more basis to stand on from a technical viewpoint, not a fundamental one. Let's use, I don't know, the 200 days moving average. Here's the SPX. 200 days in yellow. We're trading above that. Usually that happens in bull markets, not in bear markets. So if you're a technician, if you're a pure technician, you look at this and say, okay, we're above 200 days moving average. I'm buying. That's a bull market right here. What about the 200 weeks moving average? Same story. A lot of bears would argue and say, we haven't even seen the beginning of the bear market because usually they happen when charts trade below the 200 weeks moving average. We barely traded below the 200 weeks moving average. All we've seen right now is a correction. And then the bear market starts in October, December, whatever month it is, when the chart breaches below the 200 weeks moving average. But for now, since bear markets usually happen below the 200 weeks, we're now trading above it. Isn't this a bull market? If you're looking at it from the chart's perspective alone, yes, it is. This is not a bear market. This is a bull market. This is just a dip. Now, we look at another technical indicator. What about the breadth? We talked about the breadth. It's not good. Right now, this year, the 23 rally, it's only two sectors, really. XLK technology and the XLY for cyclicals, mostly because of Amazon. But maybe this is usual in uh, the transition from bear markets to bull ones. In bottoms, maybe this is a common look. Let's see. We go back to the 18 bottom, which is the base case for the bulls right now. The breadth was much better. Immediately, within months, every single sector was positive by a lot. Huge recovery. This is not the kind of look we're seeing right now. How about we go back to the 09 bottom? A few months after, pretty much every single sector was trading positive with huge gains, not just two. We go back to the dot com bottom. Again, not the best breadth at all, but we see most sectors in the green with major gains, with no outliers. 
the gains are more inclusive than just two sectors. And this is one low mark that the bulls get from the technical argument alone. They got the moving averages, but when it comes to the breadth, not so good. What about valuations? Maybe the valuations right now are looking like the bottoms before. Let's take a look. The headline says, Tech Surge Sends Valuations to Extremes. But traders don't care. What are they talking about? Optimism that the Federal Reserve will pivot from its most aggressive interest rate hiking cycle in four decades, a major headwind for the industry this year, has pushed the S&P 500 Information Technology Index up 19% in 23, compared with a gain of 7.7% for the S&P 500 Index. That's Information Technology's strongest start to a year relative to the S&P 500 since 2009. So that's a good sign, isn't it? Last month alone, the sector beat the broader gauge by the most in two decades. That's also a good sign. Dot com bottom, right? But enough with the bullish talk, here comes the bearish. One valuation model, however, shows the euphoria has gone too far. What are they talking about? Tech stocks in the S&P 500 are trading at almost 25 times respective earnings. That's also known as forward PE. But listen to this, this is the most important part. To justify such a multiple, the Fed would need to cut rates by at least 300 points. Data compiled by Bloomberg Intelligence show. Listen to this, that's more than five times what the swap market is pricing in for rate cuts this year. Absolute delusion, way off the mark way over their heads. Tech bulls have been emboldened by the possibility that the Fed is close to ending its rate hikes, pushing the S&P 500 tech stocks to their best first quarter since 98. A big chunk of those gains happened in March, when chaos in the US banking system sent traders flocking to cash-rich tech names in search of safety. So again, when it comes to the valuations, you can make a bullish argument, you can make a bearish one. We'll call that neutral. Here's a new argument by the bullish camp. They say, oh, but Maverick, the Fed is actually right now, this moment, the Fed is stimulating the economy. The Fed is stimulating the stock market. Well, how is that happening? I thought they're cutting rates, uh, they're reducing the balance sheet. What's happening here? What they're talking about is the balance sheet of the Fed shot up higher, hundreds of billions of dollars because of the collapse of regional banks. Well, let's say Silicon Valley Bank. The Fed opened all of these facilities, and if you open the cookie jar for everybody, banks, whether they need the money or not, they're going to take it. Why not? And this increases the Fed's balance sheet. Traders look at this as, well, this is a good sign. The Fed is re-greasing the market. Bye, 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 bye. To the moon, brah. All-time highs. But is the increase in uh, Fed balance sheet in a declining trend really good for the equities market? Let's take a look. We go back uh, to the 2018 bottom. It actually took place while the Fed balance sheet was decreasing. QT, not QE. Here's another one. We go back to the GFC, the crash of 09. Fed balance sheet was exploding. The market was crashing on the other hand. It was not rallying higher because the Fed's balance sheet was increasing for the wrong reasons. So when it comes to that point, if, oh, the Fed is greasing up the market to get a buy, that's bullshit. These are lending facilities that the banks decided to abuse. And we did not need them anyways. It was just one bank, Silicon Valley Bank. But when the Fed says, hey, we got free money, they'll take it. It will give us the false impression that we have uh, QE back in the economy. So when you consider all of these facts, a lot of these arguments are being demolished one by one. And maybe this will lead us to the end of the shortest bull market ever. But rest assured, it's not unusual. Everything comes down to an end. Even uh, Phantom of the Opera. Years and years, and now it came to an end. And rumor has it, it will be replaced by uh, Bud Light the Musical, starring Kid Rock and Dick Mulvaney. Uh, no, excuse me, Dylan Mulvaney. Sorry. Anyways, folks, let's move on here before this uh, show gets out of hand. i cover the stock market activities that took place last week. We start with the closing of the indices on Friday. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing positive on Friday by 22.34 points or a gain of 0.07%. The Nasdaq also positive by 12.90 points or a gain of 0.11%. Likewise, the S&P closing positive by 3.73 points or a gain of 0.09%. We'll look at the sectors on Friday. At number one, capturing the gold medal, healthcare. At a number two for the silver, consumer cyclicals. Number three for the bronze, consumer defensives. The laggard. The day was uh, metals, materials, that was down. But again, I like healthcare at this junction right here in the market, and I've been buying healthcare. It continues to outperform no matter what. 
Now, when we look at the weekly sector's performance, we see at number one capturing the gold medal defensives, number two for the silver real estate, number three for the bronze industrials. The laggard for the week, communication services, energy, and materials. What is the theme here for the week? It's all over the place. It's all about earnings. Communication services went down because of AT&T and Google. Energy down for the most part because futures down. Same goes with metals. Now, when it comes to the leadership of defensives, there is a reason why I like defensives and healthcare at this point. You want to talk about resiliency and safety, it's not in big caps. With defensives and healthcare, these are the best margins, some of the best cash flows. Sure, valuations not the best, but we know they have the pricing power and their input cost is going down. Inflation is cooling off. Sure, that's good for input cost. And while most sectors match the reduction in input cost by a reduction in prices, meaning a reduction in revenues, the consumer staple companies don't have to do that. They can enjoy the drop in costs, but not reduce prices at all. They got the pricing power. What are you going to do? Not eat? Not wipe your ass with Procter & Gamble products? You have to do that. Look at P&G's earnings that we got this week. Clear illustration for this point. When it comes to the breadth on Friday, NYC 43% advancing versus 55% declining. The Nasdaq 46% advancing versus 51% declining. The market maker wanted a neutral, clo neutral close. They wanted everybody to lose their money. They got their wishes. They closed pretty much flat, be it in the indices or when it comes to the breadth. On to commodities. Here's the closing on Friday. We got modest gains in crude under 1% apiece. The dollar was not moving one way or the other. Yet we got a drop in nat gas, be it modest at least in uh, natural gas lingo. When it comes to softs, we have drops led by lumber, sugar, and coffee futures. On the other hand, we have cocoa, cotton, OJ, all in the green. When it comes to metals, again, the recession trade is kind of losing some steam here. It's too crowded right now, so we see gold and silver pulling back even more. Copper, same story here, which is kind of weird because copper is going down because of recession fears. Gold and silver are going down because the trade of the recession is too crowded for now. We see metals, platinum is the winner for the week, up by about 3%. When it comes to meats, flattish with exception of lean hogs futures, up about one and a quarter percent. Grains down across the board on Friday. Sizable declines here for soybean oil, corn, soybean meal, soybeans, and even wheat futures, all down. While we have some modest gains for canola and rough rice futures. <laughs> Onto the options market, the big casino. Here's the action from Friday. Again, OPEX volume will be higher. No surprise here. The surprise is, well, number one, people are still buying calls. Number two, the IV rank, the implied volatility is really, really low. In other words, if the market does indeed crash in, let's say, two months from now, then this is a generational opportunity of buying these puts really, really cheap. Are they going to make it this easy? I don't know. But for now, with the VIX below 17, with the implied volatility across all of these names, at a one-year low or close to, that's an opportunity. We'll see what happens, but on Friday, the hottest table by far was Tesla with around 2.7 million contracts traded in that day, or about 50-50 between calls and puts split around the middle. There is a case for a rebound, maybe it takes us 3-4% to the upside there is of course perhaps a better case for more declines to come but at some point the name will become oversold and catch a rebound the question is how much pain before that happens amazon at number two with around 1.7 million contracts traded on friday about 72 and a half percent of those were calls we're seeing a gamma squeeze here in amazon it has been the ad performer by far due to this gamma squeeze number three apple with around 1 million contracts traded on friday about 55 percent of those were calls on to the new Usual activities that took place in the options market on Friday, we start with the ticker EQT, a name that I own in my portfolio, so I followed this trade as a hedge. In a nutshell, 30 bucks puts for the expiration date, May 19th, with expectations that EQT will lose more than 8% of its value by then. And we paid around 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $1.2 million. How about the put spread on the SPY? Somebody bought the 380 and they sold the 360 all for the expiration date, June 2nd, expecting the SPY to go down by more than 8% by the expiration date, but not more than 12.5%. They paid around one buck and 70 cents a piece for buying the 380 puts. They got in credit 
about 70 cents a piece from selling the 360 ones. All in all, the entry cost is down to one buck a piece. The total is one and a half million dollars. What about USB? US Bank. I used to own the name in my portfolio a while ago. I'm really surprised that this bank is in trouble right now. In any case, somebody bought the 30 bucks puts for the expiration date, July 21st, with the expectations that USB will go down and lose more than 10.5% of its value by then. They paid around one and a half buck a piece, standard, the straight, all in all, spending around one and a half million dollars. And here it is. PG, Procter & Gamble, good earnings on Friday, maybe more gains to come. Somebody bought the 165 calls for the expiration date, July 21st, with expectations that the name will go higher and gain more than 6% by then. They paid around one buck and 60 cents a piece, standard, the straight, all in all, spending around $1.6 million. And last but not least, what about IGT, International Gaming? They make these, um... You go to Vegas in any bar, you'll find these machines, the poker machines. They make them. They used to be a hot stock at some point, not anymore. But maybe somebody sees a little bit of a change here, IGT becoming hot again. And they bought the 31 calls for the expiration date, July 21st, with the expectations that IGT will go up and gain more than 8% by then. They paid around one buck and 40 cents a piece, then are the straight, all in all, spending around one and a half million dollars. On to the heat map from Friday again. Earnings speak the loudest. Pullbacks in financials, pullbacks in industrials, pullback in energy, pullback in materials, pullback in tech and chips. TSM was down by more than 4%. It gave up a lot of the gains after earnings, if not all of them. And the gainers, SAP, that's due to earnings. PG, also earnings. A lot of the healthcare stocks did pretty good. Some due to earnings, some not. Why not stick to healthcare? And then we have Amazon. That's moving higher due to a gamma squeeze. That's a mechanical reason. Options. You know what's going on. And then we got the ticker T for AT&T. That's rebounding about 3% or so off losses because of earnings north of 10%. Just a rebound for now. Some would argue a dead cat bounce. We'll see what happens. Here's the weekly heat map. The picture is clear. The hottest sectors, not hot anymore. Whether we're talking about chips, for the most part, they're down. Intel was down big. TSM, AMD, all down. The exception for now is NVIDIA, but that will go down too. And then we got communication services, ugly across the board. Google down, Meta down, Verizon down, AT&T down, even Netflix down. The Chinese names are down, Alibaba. And of course, Tesla, the souffle, down by more than 10%, taking down GM, Ford, all of them down. Energy, down across the board. Materials, down across the board. In healthcare, insurance plans are down. I told you guys, if you're going to buy healthcare, stick to Big Pharma and stick to the devices. Stay away from insurance. These companies should be classified as financials anyways. Speaking of, the majority of financials were down for the week. What is the message here? We can say it's earnings, but the leadership is no longer big caps, no longer uh, software and chips or Tesla, Meta. The leadership now coming from healthcare and staples. Some coming from industrials once in a while. But you see healthcare and staples holding up pretty good. And who's been telling you this since the beginning of the year? Yep, the guy you're listening to right now. Moving on to the weekly heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? Again, muted reactions for the most part, but the leadership is not coming from the XLK technology. The leadership is not coming from the SMH chips. The leadership is not coming from gold, GDX gold miners, or be it the GLD all down. The leadership is not coming from energy either, XLE, XOP all down. So what's going on here? Sure, financials, that's the rebound, we get it, it's fine. The ad performance are now becoming staples, healthcare slash XBI, biotech, that's not going to last. Utilities to a certain extent, and of course, real estate and the home builders are rallying higher because of rates going Going down for now but that's a shaky rally too the most solid footing right now is happening in the xlu to a certain degree i would argue there is more overvaluation in the xlu but we also see it in consumer staples and healthcare you look at internationals the EWZ was the loser, along with Chinese equities. If we would extract the theme for the week, it would not be inflationary because the EWZ is down, energy is down. It's not going to be recessionary because gold miners are down, and it's not going to be expansionary because technology is lagging, not leading. Cyclicals are lagging, retail is lagging. But all of a sudden, we have uh, this rally concentrated in the best cash flow, best balance sheet companies with good dividends. We see them in staples, we see them in healthcare, we see them in utilities 
we see them in rates, but I'll be more careful with these two. With that being said, I favor healthcare and staples. But for now, let's move on to cover some charts and then wrap it up when we begin with SPY, the S&P 500. 30 minutes chart, what do we see here? All in all, nothing happened. The support is still at 410, resistance at around 415, 416. Some points for the bears because we have lower highs. And then, of course, the obvious point for the bulls, support is intact for now the bears would say that this is a consolidation pattern of a bear flag which means we break below the important support and the bulls lose the bulls of course will counter and say wait a minute here this looks more as a reverse head and shoulder formation which means sooner or later we make it above the sloping line of lower highs forming a higher high that takes us all the way to 416 if not all the way to 420 but now in a chart like this both teams have an argument how do we know who wins how about 410 if that support is lost Bears win. Intact, bulls win. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract. What do we see here in the E-mini? Within range, nothing happened for weeks and weeks. 4,100 support, 4,180 as resistance for now. The warning signs come from volume moving higher. That's bearish, not bullish. And then we got the hour side. That's not a negative divergence, but losing some momentum here. The MACD indicator also losing momentum, about to cross, producing red impressions in the histogram, indicating the end of the bullish momentum, the beginning of the bearish momentum. But so long as the support of 4100 is intact, we don't have any bearish break yet. The chart remains bullish until the support line is broken. And you can see the same thing here in the SPX, the cash index. It appears that for now we have the risk of a double top. The confirmation will be if the chart loses 4100 as support. There is a lot of risk here. The trend line is already steep. It appears that it is in the process of being broken. The next thing you know, 4100. The hour size no longer in positive divergence. It is slowing down, not losing a lot of momentum, but slowing down. MACD also slowing down, about to produce red impressions in the histogram indicating bearish momentum. If he had to bet, he'd say, okay, the loss in momentum leads to the loss of 4100, and then what happens? If all of the betting going on in the SPX is for 4200, and it cannot keep 4100 as support, more selling will follow. This is the importance of 4100. Over to the Q's 30 minutes chart, what do we see here? Again, lower highs, not a good indicator for the bulls, encouraging for the bears, but not decisive yet. And the reason is, sure, we have lower highs and lower lows, but the support of 313 is still here. Better yet, 316 remains intact. So the bulls are still in charge until we start to lose some of these support lines. And of course, the bulls will counter and say, wait a minute here, we closed above 316. Isn't this a reverse head and shoulder formation? Here we go. The bears are going to counter and say, no, 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 no. This is a beginning of a bear flag pattern or even an inverse ABC pattern. For now, the chart gives both sides something to chew on, at least for now. But the conclusion and the winner will be revealed soon. Look at the daily chart, continuous contract for the Qs. Still holding on 13,000 as support with 13,300 as resistance for now. But we have warning signs. Volume moving higher. That's bearish, not bullish. The hour size and negative divergence losing momentum. So is the MACD. The chart is is in a consolidation mode asking for buyers but if it is a pyramid scheme rally that requires more and more buying to continue to go higher what if we run out of buyers what if the pros don't want to buy and everybody's locked in now what happens with no new buyers the rally frizzles out and holders become sellers and we see a flush down in this case the most important support would be 12,766 what about the IWM small caps an hourly chart what do we see here consolidating within range sure it made a lower high concerning for now but it is keeping support of the gap and we see the RSI actually improving in the hourly it all depends Depends on uh, regional banks. We have an important one, FRC, that blows up. IWM will blow up too, and vice versa. The Dixie, the dollar, four hours chart. What do we see here? The dollar is consolidating just below 102, which is resistance for now, used to be support but it is close it is gathering energy gathering momentum despite all of the bad news economically speaking the recessionary news the dollar is holding because it is oversold for now because it will be important as we head to the fed meeting what if the fed is too hawkish you gotta buy the dixie now as an insurance policy which could end up pushing the dixie all the way to 103 if not beyond and if that happens if the dixie trades above 103 you're gonna start to see a lot of trouble in the nasdaq the big caps, not going to hold pretty good. You might see a lot of pain in gold too if that happens. For now, 
Not a lot of pain, consolidating in a bear flag pattern, losing a little bit of momentum in the RSI and the MACD indicators, but the important support of 1928 remains intact, at least for now. Not a lot of pain will happen to gold until it loses 1900. And what about the SLV silver daily chart? What do we see here? Overbought conditions in the RSI, the MACD, they're correcting right now. And as they do so, we see a bear flag pattern forming and it is breaking out already. Question is, how far will it get us? All the way down to 21.57 or a little above that. Gonna wait for the rebound, wait for the top again in the Dixie, and then you hop in. Brent Oil, a daily chart, what do we see here? The bears are closing in now. 85 is lost, the trend line is lost, but we still have the support of the gap, and most importantly, we got 77 as support. Will the bulls fight back? Will they say, okay, 85 was a little too much, 86 was a little too much, now we're at 81, 80. I think I'm a buyer here. If the bulls don't show up, the bears are going to pile in, they will get us back to 77. And there goes the entire OPEC plus pump. How about the two year? What do we see here? Within range, caught resistance, moved down. Is it gaining ground again? Is it forming an ABC pattern to go all the way and close the gap at 4.59? And if that is the case, the bear flag pattern, the larger bear flag pattern goes out of the window. And oh boy, at that point, there will be a lot of pain in the stock market because yields are not going to go higher for no reason. They're going to go higher if all of these expectations of all oh, Fed pause, pivot. If we have any piece of data that says, oh, wait a minute here, inflation is moving higher. The Fed is not going to announce a pause. You're going to get 25 after 25 after 25. That would be problematic. We will see yields moving higher, stocks moving down. And what about the TLT, a daily chart? what do we see here it looks it looks as it's going down to 103 and a half again therefore i'm not interested to buy tlt at all right now if it goes above 109 and a half call me if it goes below 100 that's gonna be a problem because it means yields are blasting higher again for the wrong reasons of course the vix four hours chart what do we see here with the positives we see a positive divergence on the RSI. Same goes for the MACD. The chart is making a higher high and higher lows. You look at the negatives, it closed yet again below 17 for the week. And it appears that it is a momentum trade right now to short the VIX. The buy puts in the VIX. It's been a winning trade so far. More traders are going to pile in, pushing the VIX down. With the risk, of course, if we get any news for a squeeze. Any piece of news that suggests that volatility should be going higher, we see a lot of short covering, a lot of switching of these bets, which could cause the VIX to explode at this point. Could it be due to earnings? Something blows up? Amazon, Google, who knows? Meta? In my opinion, the risk is too much here to short the VIX. And the risk versus reward would say you gotta be long the VIX at this point. We look at Apple, an hourly chart. What do we see here? Double top at 167.88, now forming a bear flag pattern. But the good news is it is within range. Support 163.33 remains intact. So long as we're above this number, the bulls are in charge. When we look at the weekly chart, what do we see here? The chart did close yet again, exactly at the sloping line of resistance. What was strong before is strong now, and it's going to require something special to crack above this line. The risk becomes if we have a reversal from this point on, and we see a weekly closing below 159.78 that got a short apple with both hands, because it's giving you a confirmation it's not going to make it, and it's more likely going down back to the consolidation box. Tesla, an hourly chart, what do we see here? Sure, we got an oversold bounce, but boy was pathetic which indicates weakness not even 167 and a half was captured as support we'll give it another shot it's still oversold we could see some buying here and there and we start to close some of that gap but if this holds the bears would argue that this is a reverse abc pattern but it appears that the c leg is taking us all the way down can we zoom out and see how far Sure we can. We use the daily chart, reverse ABC, the bears are targeting 144.42. If it happens rapidly, within a week, within a few days, the chart will become really, really oversold on the daily. And it would be worthy to buy a rebound trade for Tesla at 144.42 if it happens rapidly. Yet when we look at the weekly, not looking good for the souffle here. Big candle to the downside, RSI losing momentum, so is the MACD. Let's say 144.42 doesn't hold. Oh boy, we could go all the way down to the end of the channel, which would be way sub 100, even closer to 60. That's crazy. Then you look at the monthly chart of the souffle, and it's a classic dot com chart. I think the inevitable destination is going back to the 50s, 60s at some point. And last but not least, 
Tulips, Bitcoin, the daily chart. What do we see here? We've talked about the possibility of a trap. Now we know it is a trap, but we're back at the consolidation zone. Question now becomes, forget about the arrow side, the MACD. It is psychological. You saw the rally. You saw the teaser. Big pop higher in BTC above the consolidation range. But now we're back. And here's your opportunity. If you said, oh, I missed it. Bitcoin popped higher without me. Now it's back question is, are you going to buy it or are you too scared? Here comes the psychology. If the overwhelming answer is, I'm not scared, I've been waiting for this to happen, then higher we go again. But if the answer is, oh boy, maybe this was a trap, a false rally, we're back at the consolidation zone right now, maybe we lose a little more momentum and I end up catching a falling knife, no thanks. If that is the predominant thinking among the dip buyers and the sideliners, then we're going down. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar this week? Monday, nothing really. Tuesday, the 25th, we have the Case Home Chiller Index, along with the FHFA Home Price Index, along with new home sales and consumer confidence. The 26th, we have durable goods, advanced retail inventories, and all sales inventories, along with the trade balance. Thursday, the 27th, we have GDP, initial jobless claims, and pending home sales. The most important day, perhaps, would be Friday, the 28th, because we have the Employment Cost Index, and this would be critical. And then we have the PCE, that's important, but we have a teaser from the CPI, we know it's going to be down, but then you got an energy rebound, therefore the employment cost index is more important as a piece of data than the PCE. We also got the Chicago Business Barometer along with consumer sentiment once again. On the earnings calendar, we have on Monday tomorrow, we have Coca-Cola, Whirlpool and First Republic. All important companies, but you know the most important one. FRC. Fireworks coming right in the morning. I'm not going to keep you here for longer. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. How's the stock market? Up, up, up. I bet while we were talking, you made like $100,000. Could be. Uh, you play the market? No, the ukulele. And I sing too.